Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, some of you may know her as Video Drew, but today it's Drew Grant. Hi. Hi, Drew. Hi. Thanks for having me on today. So happy to have you on and so happy to have a rare defense Mm -hmm. of a movie in the twilight of Blockbusting. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a movie I had never heard of and neither had had good old producer Ben. Mm -hmm. Stay Tuned from 1992, American fantasy comedy film directed by Peter Hyams, written by Jim Genawine and Tom S. Parker, starring uh, John Ritter, Pam Dauber, Jeffrey Jones, Eugene Levy, Mm -hmm. about a couple being sucked into a television world by an emissary of hell, and they must survive for 24 hours in order to be released from it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that is the plot of Stay Tuned. That's that's the plot. It does not... It is not held up... uh, under critical scrutiny, they did mm. not. They were not a huge fans of it at the time it came out. It got, uh, let's see, forty-seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes, mm. forty-one on Metacritic. Uh, it was called a bunch of a bunch of things mm-hmm. at the time. But here you are. You you love this movie. I love this movie. This is a this is a classic in my household. I remember seeing this in theaters. I was eight years old. Uh, it was my introduction to a lot of things that I think today we consider like like classic comedy like this is the beginnings of like a Rick and Morty this is the beginnings of a mystery science theater this was a pop culture satire film Mm -hmm. uh like everything in this world it's it's basically the screw tape letters but what if hell was television (laughs) network executives and every tv show they go into is a parody of something that was popular at the time so like Dwayne's Underworld Rosemary uh the three men and Rosemary's Baby yep uh, my favorite one is like the guys, two guys, old guys sitting in a chair and one's going, I can't feel my arm. And another goes, I can't see. And it's like different, different strokes. Different strokes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's very good. Did you, did, have, have this movie held a special place for you from like the entirety of your time having watched it when you were a kid? Yeah, it has. Uh, this movie and Last Action Hero are both bombs at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think to a lesser extent, uh, the Woody Allen film for Purple Rose of Cairo kind of falls into this model of... The screen is malleable. Okay. So it's like this idea that I really like, which is like you can go between the real world and the world of like your favorite, you know, like basically like a Mary Sue, I guess, or a fan casting thing where it's like you can go into the world of your favorite IP. Yeah. And like interact with the characters. Uh, And that really appealed to me as a kid, like that idea that you could just touch the screen and go through it. I think what was really cool about Stay Tuned is I was really into television. Sure. I mean, like, I, I like going to movie theaters, but you had to sit still, and, like, my ADHD brain wouldn't really let me just not run through the aisles. So television was kind of my bread and butter. Okay. Um, so watching this show in particular that makes fun of, like, Wayne's World, and it makes fun of, like, all these different, like, not even television shows necessarily, but the kind of movies that were on basic cable or premium cable. Right, you yeah. Know, Northern overexposure, like... Uh, yeah, The Silencer of the Lambs. The Silencer of the Lambs. Yep. Like, Amazing with the little dog. <laughs> like, that one's amazing. <laughs> Even the actors that are in it. Like, I think the biggest thing about this film is it, A, opened against a single white female. But, like, it opened, you know, it opened really late. It, it, low. It opened at six in the box. Buster, or yeah, in the box office, it was uh, yeah. it was really low, and it was a summer movie. It came out August fourteenth, nineteen ninety two. So like you know, tail end of summer movie season, but still we're in the middle of summer movie season. And it fits into a weird genre too. Like uh, I was talking about last night with my boyfriend, but it almost fits into this Honey I Shrunk the Kids model. But it's like too dark to be that. Like it fits into this weird like an early 90s adventure family film because, mm-hmm. you know, they have two kids and the kids are helping and the jokes are very much played for like a kid audience. Like yeah. the, the, the reactions are like big. They go into a Chuck Jones actually animated the cartoon segment. And there's mm-hmm. like, it plays for kids, but a lot of the jokes go over kids' heads and they're too dark for actual children. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lot of, I had never, I'd never heard of this movie. It reminded me the thing, uh, the most that I felt the most like, if I had seen this movie instead of UHF when I was a kid, mm-hmm. then I probably would be more in the vein of le- of, of where you're at, mm-hmm. where it's like this movie, I can see why it would hold mm-hmm. a nost- like a level of nostalgia, a level of like, oh, you can see where this kind of comedy on screen gets birthed. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
I have this is where I have some mm-hmm. questions because I'm because I'm intrigued because like I um I'd never seen it like I said never heard of it great watched mm-hmm. it I I had a real my biggest problem with it sure was the pacing okay interesting yeah, yeah. I was I got thirty minutes in yep and I had to tap out. Oh my gosh! Did you not even finish the film? No, I did. I did finish it. I did go back, but I it was it wasn't for like not liking it. I was just getting I was getting tired, and I was and I I I, I knew I was like I can't do this movie the injustice of like not paying mm-hmm. attention to it at least. Mm-hmm. But I I stopped the movie, and I had been it had been thirty minutes. And I was like, it feels like it's been so much longer mm-hmm. because it felt like the the narrative of the movie itself. Mm-hmm. Of them, like of of going into this like hell dimension television realm, mm-hmm. that really started to take a sideline to what I felt was the most fun part, which is all the parodies. Right. It, it was sort of like if um, Pleasant Phil started with thirty minutes of filler before, yeah. like they got sucked into the TV. Yeah. Yeah. I I wish that they had just jumped right in because mm-hmm. those. The the parodies are so spot on. It's so good. It's I really love those. Mm-hmm. I thought that there was a lot of great aesthetic choices. Mm-hmm. Even the I what would I guess you'd call it like the war room where they're hanging yeah. out and they have like this tracker, the scoreboard. Yeah, they say great things on it, like uh, like today is Saddam Hussein Day. Yes, like, Saddam Hussein Appreciation Day. Saddam Hussein <laughs> Appreciation Day. It says remember, just say yes. It's like it's yep. great. It's the whole. Th- satire part about it being screw tape letters but for television reminds me of scrooge like you know like it's just mapping out something onto like the tv landscape specifically the television landscape of mm-hmm. like of the time which yes. is really good yeah. and even the the subtlety of like i can't think of comedies often as having mm-hmm. good cinematography mm-hmm. i feel like you know, production design, obviously, they had to make it on point with this mm-hmm. in order for all of the parodies to work. Mm-hmm. But there's even some of the, like, the cinematography, like, I was really struck by when they were in the war room mm-hmm. and they have this shot where it's uh, it's Jeffrey Jones's character, Spike, and... The guy from Dexter, right? Yeah, and Eric King um, and Eugene Levy's character. Mm-hmm. And they're all silhouetted against this map mm-hmm. that's in neon. And it was just a, be- it was a beautiful shot yeah. that you would see in like the hunt for red October or Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And it felt like there was this level of sophistication that I, I haven't really seen in a comedy. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I I don't think that that's the kind of thing that like with a high concept comedies, like the kinds you see would see so often like the eighties and the nineties, they haven't really carried on. And I wish that there was more of that, in modern comedies. You know, this is, it's funny you say that. This was written by uh, two ad executives, I believe, who never wrote another film ever again. But they, they clearly are people who love, like, you know, telling stories. Like, this is clearly, like, you know, that's why they're all kind of, like, blip interstitials. But the even the casting, uh, I know they wanted Richard, Dreyf- uh, Richard Dreyfuss and, um, uh, who was it, uh, Susan, uh, Barbara Streisand originally. Yeah, that and- might- that have been good. And they wanted Tom Bur- uh, Tim Burton to be the, the director, director. Which would have been incredible. But um, So that means like the script was going around Hollywood, even though it was made by basically two unknowns for a while. And then this guy, the guy who made, uh, was it Time Cop is what he did? He directed uh, Time Cop. Peter Hyams. End of Days, yeah. Time Cop, uh, uh, Sudden Death. Running Scared. Running yeah, Scared, yeah. 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 Um, um, but so like what I think about this movie is that like this is sort of the predecessor to Adult Swim. This is like this is a lot of... This is why it was kind of like open so weird is because in 1992, we weren't used to the idea of television as an artistic medium. So this whole movie about TV being this like thing that is of interest or like even people would want to watch a movie about television. Mm -hmm. It it played even worse than Last Action Hero, which is a movie about people who want to go into movies. You know, both of them kind of have a love for the lowbrow genres that they're sending up. Just sort of like Last Action Hero had Shane Black come on and do the dialogue. Right. This movie had... Two TV stars, and one like very meta moment. It was like my dad had to explain to me as a kid why it was funny that John Ritter was going into the world of, of the Three's Company reference. Yeah. Yes, which yeah. is I mean it's a it's a great visual gag, and it pops in and pops right back out. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have uh, some bad news for you, Drew. Oh, unfortunately, no. these uh, these these writers they actually did write a couple other movies. Oh no, did they really? They did really, and here's oh, no. they were not they're not 
well regarded, which is probably why they may have been lost to the sands of time. Oh God, I'm backpedaling so hard you it's, can't see me right no, now. No, no, no. Uh, so here's all right. So they this they didn't get credit for it, but they wrote the very first draft of Super Mario Brothers. Okay, well they're geniuses. Yes, clearly. <laughs> okay, um, enough uh, said. They also wrote Richie Rich. Not a bad film. Okay. They also uh, were part of the 35 writers attached to the Flintstones. The first one? The first one. And they they were two of the three who actually made and got screen credit, along with Steven D'Souza. I mean, I don't, like, again, these guys, if I'm remembering correctly, are ad guys, right? They were, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. commercials. I don't know who they, like, who they got in good with in Hollywood. But I don't know. They, they went, but, like, this script was being passed around, like like you said, to Tim Burton. Like, this was being passed around, and... and uh, Peter Hames like wanted it. He like he like championed for this movie being made. That actually makes me like them a lot more. I thought this was a one and done Super Mario pass. Like, can you imagine the first pass? Of the I would Super love Mario to movie? see what their pass of Super Mario would have been like. Yeah, like they went harder on it, like being just about like two plumbers, like named Mario Mario. Like it's just <laughs> it's just more about it's thirty minutes of that setup, yeah. and then you get into Koopaville. I would love to see yeah like a like a very uh, a very existential Mario crisis that they could be dealing with. It's Groundhog's Day. You just keep resetting every time you die. Yes. In Mario. Um, I also. I mean, I think the I've, I've talked about the Flintstones and Super Mario Brothers on the show before, mm -hmm. and I had somebody come in hating the Flintstones, and I rewatched it, and I was like, "This movie is going to be bad." And then I was shocked at how much I like the Flintstones. Oh no, it's great! Kyle MacLachlan as the bad guy is like a perfect. It's so much fun. Yeah, yeah, it was a great film. Richie Rich was also a like again. These are based on previous IPs, which I guess these guys is advertising. Dudes kind of can do really well, but they can tap into a certain voice. They can tap into like a certain like genre. It reminds me of the, you know, whatever. But it reminds me of that Rick and Morty episode where they just do the commercials. Yeah, like, the interdimensional cable. Yeah, 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 that's what this movie is. It's interdimensional cable, except it's hell. Like, so mm -hmm. it's to me like it's even funnier because it's like this was so ahead of its time. Like, I didn't get half the jokes. They're really dark comedy for yeah. like a kids movie. And I believe the last thing I read was in 2020 they were reviving this as a TV show. Oh, interesting. Which will be. Amazing. I mean, that would be a very fun TV show. Like an Adult Swim version of Stay Tuned that just cycles through the different like parodies. Like today, with all we have, like when we consider prestige television, like it would be a totally different ball game. Mm -hmm. of, like you know, making fun of Game of Thrones as if it's like you know some you know playing up gluttony or something. I don't know. I, I wonder don't... who they have attached. Oh, here's what it, I'm I'm looking it up right now because the I feel. The, the person who immediately comes to mind is who I would want to see take the reins and do this and who could do it right is Casper Kelly from Too Many oh, Cooks. Yeah, of course, and Yule Log. And yep, Yule Log. I give it to maybe Casper, I maybe give it to Casper Kelly or the Wham Comedy guys uh, who did unedited footage of a bear. Yep, and, you they'd know, be good. Uh, Alan Resnick would be great. Yeah. I also just think, you know, like it, it could really be a lot of adult swim people a lot of these animators i would have like a lot of animation in this version you mm -hmm. know give them some give them some work um the space ghost people like the whole vibe of what this plays on is like late night t cable tv but you could do it like prestige drama now it could be Mad Men. it could be you know the sopranos it could be like making fun of all these things um and i think like the charlie kaufman of it all could be like <laughs> next level like it would just be worlds within worlds within worlds they yeah. keep watching shows within the world right casper kelly would be great choice. we're gonna get yeah it's gonna be a weird hybrid of too many cooks and synecdoche new york yeah what this is <laughs> exactly. ultimately gonna wind up being <laughs> exactly but i hear and this is the 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 real question for me from uh, as somebody who is Mm -hmm. Such a fan of it. Mm -hmm. The thing that I, like I said, one of the things I had a hard time connecting with uh, this movie because of the pacing, but also I feel like the, like I didn't, I wouldn't say that I hated this movie oh, as good. much as some of the critics did. Mm -hmm. But I also wouldn't say that like, I, I, I think there's a lot of places where this movie missed. I think that the, the angling of doing it as, like a family adventure Agreed. comedy, I feel like is a real misfire. I, I, I agree entirely. As an adult, I can see like this is not a kids movie. So why were they trying to make it Honey That Shrunk the Kids? Like to the <laughs> point where there is a we were reading last night. There's an episode of the Honey I Shrunk the Kids TV show that involves them getting sucked into a television, and I feel like that would be the appropriate venue for some of this. But like it needs to be a different style. It should have been like more child like aim towards kids this is aimed towards adult different mm -hmm. you know like different strokes rosemary three men and rosemary's baby david like, dukes of hazard david dukes that's what i mean i've i cackled <laughs> when i saw that in the post credits yeah. that, that it's there's so many the actually funny jokes in this mm -hmm. but it this i feel like 
the fact that this movie has the angle of like, all right, we're going to let families, this is going to be the family trip to mm-hmm. go see this movie before we send the kids back to school mm-hmm. really hamstrings its potential. I mean, look, it played to the Grant family. Like that was, that was what it played to. <laughs> this taught me like what satire was. I remember my dad having to explain irony to me. He was like, look, it would be the same. Cause I knew Mork and Mindy really well. He's like, this would be like if, if that woman from this movie showed up and it was Mork and Mindy, cause you know how she's the, the, girl on that show yes. and I was like okay and I was like I get it and she he was like so she would scream because it's not the same character it's the same actress uh you know she could Tiffany Robinson to do this too this would also be amazing um but yeah like he he was like she's would take up two existential places like in the reality where she wouldn't understand that this is also her world and I was like whoa that's really deep this will lend itself much better for a TV show yeah. that it's ever going to do for a movie because also the narrative arc of John Ritter learning to love his family again and becoming a fencing guy, uh, like you know, <laughs> the fencing on its face is so ridiculous it's as a, as a thing to for for him, him to, to find himself ag- again and be like, this is how I'm gonna, this is my purpose. But on another level, it makes total sense that this guy. I mean, the problem is that we only see him kind of loving sports. Yeah. Before this, like before the show starts, so he's like a real big sports guy. What we needed to see was that he's more like in his own world of fantasy stuff. Like he likes watching old movies and he likes watching TV shows. So therefore, like he knows the rules of how these things operate better. Like that would have made him a better character. And I think if, yeah, yeah, I think John Ritter did a lot of weird family films. Like Problem Child, also very weird movie for like kids. Like Problem Child is like a very violent, like mean spirited movie. I've never seen Problem Child. Oh, really? It's strange. I have a lot of, I have a lot of blind <laughs> spots. Yeah. So Problem Child was like this, this movie that was, cruel in the same way that this movie is cruel although probably not getting like as dark as this movie did, does okay. but the idea is that he wants to adopt a kid and he's a super nice guy and the and the kid itself is like it's basically like the orphan kid i mean it's an actual child and not like an adult with a thing around her neck like, gotcha but it is like he's evil and he's just like a bad person and he just wants to like have everyone die basically. Oh, like, but so, it's a comedy it's a comedy and it's a it's a family comedy so like <laughs> i just don't think like well, we knew what we were doing family comedies in the 90s it was either based it on like but adam's family worked and that was like again like an ip that was a based on a new yorker cartoon sure. and like b like doesn't necessarily lend itself to family comedy it just was a was good family. It, um didn't the brady bunch movie come out in the 90s 94 or something like that and that yeah that was another send-up that was like satirizing a previously beloved like IP, but doing it in like this dark modern environment where like they didn't fit very well. But it was like very, it was good. Like Adam's Family, Brady Bunch, they took the idea of, you know, I think this is what the Munsters try to do to a lesser extent uh, recently, but I don't think it was uh, well received. But taking the idea of these, these characters that exist in this one world, it's the opposite of a stay tuned, right? So you're taking these characters that exist in like an, you, you know, you, you, utopian television landscape and moving them into the real modern world Mm -hmm. and so it's like a reverse stay tuned yeah yeah okay now here's i i feel like as uh as a fan of this movie Mm -hmm. as 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 a rare defense on Mm -hmm. the show sure i would like to hear your thoughts i have a couple of critical reviews from the time let's do it who were not fans and i want uh, and i want to hear what you think about some of these takes i bet ebert hated this one i actually i couldn't find an ebert review huh i'm gonna i gotta take a look but i do have one from uh right here oh geez (laughs) (laughs) hold on i'm I'm debating which one i want to go to first go ahead it's from variety uh, joseph mcbride not diabolical enough for true black comedy, too scary and violent for kids lured by its PG rating, and witless in its send-up of, of obsessive TV viewing. Stay tuned is a picture with nothing for everybody. <laughs> That's funny. First two criticisms valid. Third criticism way off the mark. But this, again, is during an era where TV was not considered worth satirizing. Mm-hmm. TV was considered really lowbrow and stupid and just where you went to watch reruns or like... Yeah, so I get it. Like, 80s TV going into the early 90s, not a lot on. So I get you, man, but it's not witless. It's very funny. (laughs) Um, Yeah, this is a little later on in the review. Intended as a satiric commentary on the dangers of excessive TV watching, Mm -hmm. Stay Tuned stays flatly on the surface of its subject, succumbing to the same kind of wretched, idiotic excess it intends to criticize. Yeah, this guy probably hated Beavis and Butthead, too. (laughs) He probably did. (laughs) Yeah, this is is early MTV generation stuff that they're going to just rebel against because they're old um, this is a review from Mark Savlov of the Austin Chronicle. He gave it two stars. Out of two? Out of five. Oh, damn. Okay. That was like <laughs> a, a thumbs. A perfect rating. of We're getting real binary here. Mm-hmm. Um, 
No matter how hard you try, it's always difficult not to second-guess films you haven't seen yet. And judging solely from the promotional trailers that have been running for a while, Stay Tuned looked to me as uninspired as its title. Did he see the the movie? He did see the movie. Okay, good, good. Thankfully, in this case, I mean, it's a bad sign when you're like, all right, the trailer even doesn't make me want to watch this movie from a reviewer's standpoint. It's hard to sum up from the trailer, though. The poster is also incorrect. It shows a family with a dog. That is not in the movie, and it says uh, something about cable TV when this is satellite TV. So that people just didn't understand the marketing because it was incorrect. To, for for a movie written by ad execs, how can you not have your marketing a little bit more dialed in? Because the marketing team does not work <laughs> like right for the movie. <laughs> um, thankfully, in this case, my negative expectations were unfounded. Well, oh. sort of. Oh. Network it ain't, but this lopsided new comedy of terrors from Peter Himes isn't nearly as awful as you might think. Which mm-hmm. is actually that's kind. Of, this is shockingly positive for a movie that he gives uh, two stars. Oh, here we go. Uh huh. All right, here um, we're, we we got to skip ahead to get to the real, real big problem. Let's go here. Stay tuned has a lot to say as is, as a take on contemporary television mm-hmm. culture. Stay tuned has a lot to say, but yeah. much of it is presented in such a broad comedic format that it passes by unnoticed. Mm-hmm. This is a comedy, after all. Politics aside, though, it never really rises above the level of mediocrity and never actually descends to the level of television itself. I'm going to need you to go back into the previous paragraph and figure out the politics that he thinks this movie has. What are the politics? Is this like a Tipper Gore thing? Like what this is, is he does, and this is you know this, he's not even referencing any sort of political thing. I think if we're talking politics, it's just the sake of like oh, I guess TV is rotting people's brains, children's brains specifically, probably. Yeah, I guess I guess that is the commentary they're trying to make. And look, they weren't wrong. The thing they are satirizing, I don't think it's. Uh, I think this guy is more on the money, which is that again this would be better suited as a tv show there's no emotional stakes in the characters the characters act as two-dimensional as like rick moranis's kids or like rick moranis and honey i shrunk the kids you get that they're going to get back together the the main couple that they're going to find themselves like again the the meat of this movie is just a really quick almost background almost credit like sequences of just the jokes so it is just like a you know, Beavis and Butthead take America or whatever. Like, it, yeah. it's just about, like, the vehicle delivery of something so novel and fresh as, like, a bunch of, like, just cartoons or a bunch of um, commercials for, like, things that don't exist, like Dwayne's Underworld, excrement. Like, yeah. it's so good. <laughs> um, now, here I do feel like this is uh, uh, another area that I feel like maybe we can get some, some fun uh, defense from you out of. Oh, love it. So... I this is my, in the twilight of the show. I've discovered mm-hmm. that it's there's a lot of really insane reviews on Amazon and Google. Oh my god, I cannot wait to hear what mm-hmm. the, the reviews of this movie are. And so uh, I usually go for Google on this, and unfortunately, Google only had three reviews of the movie, and uh, yes. they did not have any actual words. People just gave them star ratings. However, mm-hmm. Amazon is rife with bad reviews. Um, first of all, big problem on Amazon. Apparently, people in the early 2010s were getting uh, bootleg DVD copies of Stay Tuned. Which is perfect. I would love the DVD for Stay Tuned to just be like bootleg from hell, Stay Tuned. Like, it's just That almost, actually like, would be so, that would be great viral marketing. That's really in depth. Yeah, that's like, again, like to the Charlie Kaufman of it all. What if it was just like the physical media of Stay Tuned was just this hell DVD? <laughs> But that main screen, you know, like, because, like, in the Gremlins 2 movie, the scene where Hulk Hogan, like, has uh-huh. to come in and, like, you know, you know, stop the Gremlins from being, like, assholes because they stop the uh, projector reel. In the DVD, like, the DVD breaks. And, like, if you read the novelization, like, the Gremlins take over the novel. Like, it's depending right. on what media it is. Like, the media res, like, it changes how the interruption happens. I think that'd be so cool for Stay Tuned. Like, it would just jump around like a DVD menu, like, when you're going to different things. Hey, that would be so much fun. I feel like, it's like, like I said, yeah. there's so much left on the table. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. These are a couple one-star reviews on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, this first one is from Michelle, one star. <laughs> Michelle. For most of the part, crap. <laughs> Despite two laughs, spelled incorrectly, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and a slight moral, this movie made no sense, had bad writing, and was so terrible it made my nine-year-old cry. <laughs> pathetic, I know. That's how bad this movie is. First of all, is it pathetic that it made a nine-year-old cry? It's pathetic that your nine-year-old cried at this movie? <laughs> this is not a scary movie for any child. I, wouldn't have, I couldn't imagine being scared by this. But wait, go back for a second. She's saying besides the two laughs and the moral, so I guess she liked the moral of the she, movie. She <laughs> liked the moral, and she liked the, she laughed twice okay i wonder what parts she laughed at do you think i i don't know if she's watching this in with her nine-year-old 
It was definitely crying. I think Northern overexposure, I think, scared me as a kid uh, when, when Eugene Levy's having his body parts ripped off. I yeah. remember being a child and being like, whoa. That's freaky. There's probably a, that's probably a scary part for a kid. Yeah, the Godzilla, the Godzilla. Oh yeah, <laughs> he comes down, kills the neighbor. <laughs> I wonder what else she might have laughed at though. Um, maybe some or uh, uh, I feel like this uh, Michelle might be a, a Wayne's a Dwayne's Underworld kind of fan. No, it's it's the Three's Company. Oh, uh, Three's Company. Company. Yeah, that's for Three's Company. Yeah, and the, there's no way the child's gonna get that. Yeah. Um, this is a one star review from Robert H. Rogers. Mm-hmm. Lame movie. Oh, Roger H. Rogers. This is one lame, cheesy movie. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Were they on pot when they made this or something? Yep, yep, yep. You got it, Roger H. Rogers. I think they were on a lot. I think they were on a lot of pot. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps. I got some bad news for Roger H. Rogers. I don't think it was pot. <laughs> I don't think it was pot. If they're ad execs, maybe not pot. Yeah, maybe not pot. But God, <laughs> I, I like that. It, like he's like it doesn't make any sense. Like he's just like upset that the format of this like content delivery is just uh, confusing. I want to see if Robert H. Rogers has made Review- any other reviews. Uh, let's say not to get off on a tangent. But what else has he reviewed? Um, he's reviewed some books. Ken Burns. Five stars of Watership Down. Okay, well, that's a great book. What are you going to do? Best book ever. This is very good poetic literature. Highly recommend it to anyone older than 12 or 13. Um, That's funny because I would recommend Watership Down to anyone 12 or 13 about, and then I'd stop recommending it because it is, in fact, a child's book. <laughs> I wonder if he had... I'm glad he didn't have a problem with the illogic of having uh, animals Bunnies. that talk. Yeah. yeah. No, that wasn't... Yeah, I wonder if he's a big Rats of Nim fan or if he's just like, no, it's just Watership Down. <laughs> <laughs> hates Animal Farm, hates the rest of the anthropomorphic family. Peppa Pig, no. <laughs> where Robert Rogers, where are all your bad reviews? I want to see your bad reviews, pal. He likes seem he seems like he likes everything except for uh How, wait, <laughs> except for stay tuned. I'm still thinking about the Watership Down thing. He's saying that before 12 or 13 it's too it's too much to read Watership Down. Yes. Even though it's a book about bunnies. I'm not sure if I understand his <laughs> logic there. But he does seem like someone who's like, don't watch Stay Tuned, it's crap. They were on pot. But also, you can't read Roger's just down until you're old enough to like have a bar mitzvah. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's uh, a couple two-star reviews. Great. I love it. These, Roger. <laughs> uh, this is uh, 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 from J&R. Okay. Gradually went from okay to unbearable. Interesting. Waste of time. Oh. Pick something else. I wonder... So they are like the opposite of you. They really like the setup of like this family guy and he's a schlub and blah, blah. They like that part. They just wish it had stayed there. They wanted it to be a nice family comedy about a family that's falling apart. Yeah. I wonder like, you know, because it looks like, man, like I know you've, you've reviewed Last Action Hero on here too. And that movie, again, critical like flop of the box office. Box office. I think mm-hmm. when I was growing up, it was Last Action Hero and Waterworld that made me, in this movie, that made me realize I might want to be a film critic because like... How can you guys love Titanic, but like hate Last Action Hero? Like one of these movies is like it moves and it's like it's a new concept, and the other one's like a boat that they give away in the trailer is about to sink. Like yeah, I remember it was before the term spoiler alert came along, but I remember watching the preview for Titanic in the theaters, like the the trailer for it, and going, "Well, they just told us what's going to happen," and thinking I was so clever, and like looking around, being like, "Hey guys, get it?" Because like it's the Titanic. Um, um, yeah. Well, listen. Hey, we can't win them all. We can't get all of the all of these Amazon reviewers won over, mm-hmm. it, which is unfortunate. Um, but we do have some really good people who actually like this movie, and I, I do want to highlight a good positive review as well. We might as well. Might as well. This is the number one review on Amazon uh, oh. from Beth H. Malbin. Beth. She's given it five stars. Perfect. Hilarious action movie. Hmm. When I first saw this movie title, I thought it might be lame, but it got four and a half stars, so I decided, so I decided to give it a watch. I was not disappointed. Mm-hmm. There are comedies that are just not funny at all. This movie made me laugh. Mm-hmm. This is a sci-fi action-packed comedy wrapped in one. Absolutely brilliant. Highly recommend this movie. You will not be disappointed at all. Yeah. You'll love it. Where did she read that four and a half star review? <laughs> so Amazon, it actually has now it has higher than at this. Uh, mm-hmm. At the time, December 29th is when she read this, wrote this review. It's got four point seven out of five on Amazon. Yeah, because you know why? This movie is fucking perfect. Sorry, oh. I had about swearing. This movie's perfect. No, it's okay. We allow swears on this podcast. It's like it's like the White Swan. It's like this movie's <laughs> White Swan is perfect. Like this movie as a television show is going to kick ass. It's going to be so good if they ended up making it. Like, please God, bring on like all the Adult Swim people and like just 
make this happen, please, God. <laughs> There's so much in this movie that I feel like you're, I can't deny your, your POV. Mm -hmm. Like it did clear, so clearly set up a lot of the, a lot of the kinds of things that we see in comedies now and that mm -hmm. we continue to see in comedies mm -hmm. over the course of, uh, of the, into the nineties and on television, mm -hmm. which we have, of course, we're in the age of prestige TV, right? Mm -hmm. Not only do we have these prestige dramas now, but there's also these like wacky comedy shows mm -hmm. that I feel like do kind of owe a debt to movies in this vein of 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 your UHFs and mm -hmm. your stay tunes of the mm -hmm. world. And although people didn't like it at the time, and although there's still a fair amount of people who are sort of iffy on this movie, mm -hmm. I, uh, I I'm glad that you brought this to me. Look, if I can give, give you right off the cuff three ideas that could be like, and again with a half hour format, you could just you could just breeze right through them. Or even Adult Swim, fifteen minutes just per episode. You could do The Walking Dead, but everybody's alive, and like the scary part is it's from a zombie's perspective. And yeah, you call it like The Walking Ted. I don't know. There's one idea. You could do like you could do like a like one of those one of those shows like a uh, antique roadshow things, but it's just like for I don't know, you know. True crime murders. You know, mm -hmm. you could do like, you know, you could just do a bunch of things. It could be a cartoon, but it could be like a cartoon version of a Ken Burns documentary. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like you could just play around with form. It could be Mad Men, but it could be taking place in like a, uh, what's another AMC show? Oh, that would probably be The Walking Dead AMC. Yeah. yeah. Breaking Mad Men. Bad could get thrown in there. You're breaking Bad. Yeah, exactly. You could mash up so many like prestige shows with one another. You could get John Hamm in there for sure. He loves doing dumb comedy stuff. So like yeah, just have Mad Men set in the post apocalyptic like like Last of Us wasteland. Yeah, yeah. There's so much. <laughs> I think that there's something to the also the comedic. One of my favorite ways of of doing comedy is mapping. Mm -hmm. Mapping yes. is a, is an excellent way to to pull off comedy. Obviously, sketch shows have been doing it for years and years. And there's a lot of criticism of this movie there where, where where people are saying like, oh, it feels like it's just a bunch of sketches that are drawn out. But you know what? There's nothing really wrong with that. Give it to Zach Kreger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or give it to uh, Tim uh, Tim Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, that's yes, it'd yeah. be perfect. Yeah, or Tim Heidecker. Like, yeah. give it to any of them. Look, I think that this would be a like I'm saying this. I, the the mind boggles. I know that the very first script idea I ever had was basically a stay tuned, but it was instead of like being like the Hell Network executives, it was more like a depressed showrunner who like okay. somebody gets sucked into a TV and like has to get the attention of uh, they were like a TV critic and they were <laughs> got the showrunner really depressed and wanting to cancel his own show. But then they get the main character gets sucked into the world of the show, like a lost in kind of show that's kind okay. of gone off, okay. off the rail. But they have to get the attention of the showrunner who's now like suicidal and like trying to write off all the characters because if the show ends, then it, they blip out of existence. Ooh, so like okay. I like the idea of this like idea of like what the showrunners are now is basically what the spike character was like there's the executive i mean there's networks but then there's also like these characters of showrunners we all know about like mm -hmm. who these people are yeah um, and the archetypes of what showrunners are and what a writer's room is and the problems they're in yes um i think it would just be such a good landscape to play with if there's an outer world and an inner world yes yeah. um i will say for the for the listeners out there i'm, I'm guessing you've probably seen this movie mm -hmm. but in that sort of vein if you're interested in checking out uh something that has some of those elements it's obviously it's much more grounded but the tv set uh, oh, you've never seen this movie? I've never even heard of it. Okay. This is a movie, I, I, I don't want to get when it came out incorrect. I watched yeah. it when I was in college. Shout out, Elon. Um, and it's a movie that has, it's got David Duchovny, Sigourney Weaver. What? Uh, Judy Greer is in it. Fran Kranz is in it. 2006. It was directed by Jake Kasdan. Wait, wait. Sorry, you've got to slow down. Jake Kasdan directed a movie yeah. with, with Judy Greer. Yep. Uh, and <laughs> David Duchovny. Um, so Mike Klein is David Duchovny's character. He's a showrunner of a pilot uh, called The Wexler Chronicles, uh -huh. and it's about his first like, t t like filming a pilot and trying to get it to turn into a series experience. Oh my god! Uh, Sigourney Weaver plays the network exec. Oh my god! And uh, the movie is about his his show trying to get uh, it's a it's a more serious take, and then they are trying to dumb it down for a broad audience. I. I don't know how to tell you how much you just sold me on something. Uh, Jake Kasdan's <laughs> new Willow, his new Willow show is incredible. I thought that was a show like did so much to stick the landing of a, of a beloved movie. Um, Franz Kranz, it's going to be like kind of Cabin in the Woodsy if it's got Sigourney Weaver and mm -hmm. Franz Kranz. David Duchovny, one of my favorites unintentionally hilarious actors from the 90s. Uh, this 
it kind of sounds like Galaxy Quest a little bit. This sounds amazing. And there's a lot of really, like, this cast is pretty stacked, too. If you look at it, like, we got Jeez. Justine Bateman is in it. You got MC Ganey. Who's in Wait, what year was this? Uh, this was 2006. Philip oh. Baker Hall is in this movie. Oh, so that, he's also in Delirious, which is another uh, film where John Ken gets sucked into the world of his own soap opera. Yeah. Yeah. But I uh, I definitely recommend it. I'm, I'm surprised you haven't seen this. I've you got to watch it. it. I've, I went on TV Tropes last night and looked up other movies where people get sucked into the screen or try to like do a, you know, melding with reality thing. And I have never even heard of this. Well, you know what, Drew? I'm happy that I can bring this to you since I'm so you happy. brought Stay tuned to me. <laughs> I'm so happy to have this right now. I like, <laughs> where do I watch it? Can I go home and watch it right now? Like, that's amazing. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed having you on the show. This has been great. <laughs> Thank um, you so much. Where can the listeners uh, find your work and check out your stuff? Okay, yeah. Well, uh, I've been doing stuff a little bit for Fangoria recently. So if you are a subscriber, you can probably get a uh, the print subscription. I was in the most recent issue with uh, interview interviewing uh, Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson, the new Loki directors, but about their indie film, Something in the Dirt. They have a whole extended universe that is very, very cool. They do like uh, indie horror films. I'm also at Dot LA, where I'm the editorial director, but really check out Content Candy wherever you get uh, podcasts, because that's where uh, me and my partner have a bunch of shows, including the Video Chronicles, which is a uh, a sort of recap show and uh, salty popcorn reviews. We just reviewed Skin of Marink, which is Ooh. so freaking good. Oh my god! I, uh, <laughs> I, we got to talk about Skin of Marink. We do. We, get off here. we do have to talk about Skin of Marink. <laughs> and then um, Garmin shows you with this show with me and Lon Harris from uh, Honest Trailers. And um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. Video Drew across all social media. That's Video Drew one word. Nice. Yeah. And you can find me at Diet J on all the socials mm -hmm. at Blockbusting Pod for the podcast socials, and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel because we're going to start putting up all the old episodes there so that we can have them nice and archived whenever this thing comes down for a landing. Mm -hmm. um, but Drew, thanks again. Thank you so much for telling me about the TV set. I'm so happy that <laughs> I could bring that. To oh, what a nice thing! <laughs> I'm so happy. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 o